I'm Virgil Marple, University of Minnesota Emeritus, and uh, this is Dale Lundgren, University of Florida Emeritus. Hi, Dale. Hello, Virgil. Tell us how you got started in an interest in, maybe to go back to your early days. Well, I'm a true Minnesotan, born and raised in Duluth, went through high school, worked with my dad at his shoe store for about six years. He wanted me to take over the shoe store, but after six years, I decided that really wasn't what I wanted to do in life. I like to make things and all. Never did like high school. But after uh, graduation, they started that Korean War, so I gave the government a couple years of my life, which was a good thing because they repaid me with a GI Bill to me to go to college. I had never expected to go to college. But after I got out, I went to California and worked for a, most of the year, worked for McCullough Motors, thought that'd be a great job, a machinist. I made the same part about a thousand times and decided, nah, that wasn't very good. So I decided to be a draftsman. I'd taken drafting and all in high school and worked for Apex Steel, laying out big bridge beams they were using for the freeway bridges and all. And I thought that was fun. I worked for an engineer and he'd look things up in the book and I'd watch them and then I'd start doing it and he gave me hell for doing his job. So I decided I'd quit and go back to Duluth and go to college. So I came back to Duluth and walked into the University of Minnesota Duluth branch and told them I wanted to be an engineer and go to school. And they said, well, have you applied? And I said, what do you mean? You have a form to fill out? And someone else came by and looked at me and said, are you a veteran of the Korean War? And I said, yes. He said, well, you're in luck. They passed a bill at the state that allows you to get into college. So I said, good. So I started out at Duluth and I liked physics. I had physics for six quarters from Dr. Hansen, best professor I ever had. He taught me all the engineering fundamentals I needed. His GI Bill paid me along, so we got along. And the uh, week I came back, I went to the dentist and met this girl that was working in the dentist. It turned out to be my wife, to be. So we went along for about a year and a half and got married. So when I left Duluth to go down to Minneapolis, uh, I was married and we were ready to start a family. And I needed some more money to get along. So I heard about the work study program in mechanical engineering. And that was the best thing I ever did. That was really fun. I got paid for working and learned something outside of bookworm. Was that I when the program that. started? It must be close to the beginning of the program. Uh, might have been. Yeah, A.B. Algren, Professor Algren was head of it at that time, and he had an assistant, Mike Fingerson, Leroy. He started TSI, Thermal Systems, it was called at that time. When I graduated, I went in, well, it was the day before graduation. I interviewed and found a neat job out, university, out at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. They brought my wife, Helen, and I both out there for an interview. That was really nice. So I thought that'd be a great place to go to work. So I went in to get my last work study report from Algren, and he looked at me and went and checked my grades and all, and came back and said, why aren't you going to graduate school? I said, well, I got a wife, and at that time I had two children. I was busy in other ways. And he says, well, I can fix you up. I'll give you a research appointment in the particle lab, I think it was called. And you work for Whitby. Well, I'd never heard of Whitby, never heard of the particle lab. But I thought, that sounds OK. So I took it. And, he, and I said, well, how do I get into graduate school? He says, don't worry. He says, I got a friend. He's dean of the graduate school. I'll call him up. So I went over that afternoon, and half hour later, I was admitted to graduate school. This is sort of the way my life has gone, just being at the right place at the right time, and lucky. And not asking too many questions. Not asking too many, just saying thank you. That's my rule. Say thank you. Don't ask why. Just say thank you. 
So the next week I started working in the particle lab and gee, I think it was about Wednesday, this professor walked in and looked at me and said, why are you in here? And I said, oh, I work here. Who do you work for? I said, well, Algren gave me an appointment. He said, I'll work for Professor Whitby. I said, well, that's me. I didn't even see you. Well, it started out sort of bad foot, but we got along after that. I ended up working in the particle lab for three years and three months. My first assignment was to build a wind tunnel, and we built the wind tunnel, which I think is still in the lab. Well, I don't think it is anymore, but... Well, was, they finally got one, rid of that. Well, that was after, the one in the federal lab. Yep. Yeah, after 50 years. <clears throat> yeah, it was a long, there a long time. And I should say the good thing about the particle lab is we were the only lab that had air conditioning. Yeah. Aldrin had arranged that, and they didn't want the rest of the building to know about it, so we had a water condenser on it. My interest was really in heating, ventilating, air conditioning, which was Algren's specialty. I'd taken courses from Threlkeld and done very well, and I liked that because I was in Duluth. I worked for a consulting engineer, Foster and Associates. We did the mechanical, electrical, heating, ventilating for schools and hospital buildings and restaurants and all, and that was going to be my career. So I was really interested in the heating, ventilating, air conditioning, air handling, and being in the particle lab was sort of similar. You know, we were doing filter testing at that time. Yeah. So that sort of fit into my goal. So that's how I got started. And once I was in there, we did, well, they had money from heating, ventilating, air conditioning, engineering association, something like that. And we were grinding coal and making dust and testing filters. And Whitby thought that wasn't really the right way to do it. You really needed mono dispersed. How did you grind the coal? Well, we had uh, ball mills. We put coal in and ball mill it for days with you know ball steel mm -hmm. balls in there and grind it down. Then he had his sonic jet iron. Uh, dust disperser, which blew the dust through an orifice at sonic velocity and impacted it on a plate to break it up as best you could, hmm. and then disperse that into the wind tunnel, into the test duct, which we had a mixing chamber at the inlet. And I did tests on the uniformity of the mixing chamber and all that kind of thing. Actually used that same mixing chamber design 30, 20 years later when I designed the dust mixing chamber for the EPA personal exposure chamber over in North Carolina where they tested different dusts on people. So that was sort of a good training. And he wanted a uniform dust, uniform particles. So I worked on the spinning disk generate particles of a known size and we did filter testing and Whitby in his wisdom he said the test results aren't right something's wrong those particles must be charged their efficiency is too high so then we had developed his new unique sonic jet ion generator and we did tests with that, and we found out we could neutralize the particles and put them down to a Boltzmann distribution of charge, which is perfect. That's what they are in the atmosphere, given time. And then that worked fine. He wanted me to do efficiency tests on cyclones from my master's research, but I didn't want to do that. I was interested in that particle charge effect. So he said, well, you're going to have to do that on your own time. So, so I built a particle charging device to charge particles. And then I had to build something to measure the charge. So I built a little mobility analyzer. And from their, their motion in the electric field, I was able to calculate the charge on the aerosol of a known size. So I got that going. And so I was able to do filter efficiency tests and find out what effect the charge had on particle removal. And I needed a good filter to use, so I met Sam Jones, who was sort of a chairman or a leader over in 
General Mills Electronics Division. They had a research group over on Hennepin Avenue, which wasn't far away. And they had funding from AEC, the Army, Air Force, etc., to do testing on chemical, biological, radioactive aerosols in the atmosphere. And they developed a special filter of 10 micron glass fibers, which they silver coated. So it was a nice conducting filter, perfect for running my tests because the collection mechanism for the charged particles was just an image force of the particle charge in the fiber causing its attraction. And there had been a professor, John Johnstone at Illinois, I think he had a couple students, uh, Kramer and Dawkins who had done calculation on what the collection efficiency increase should be due to particle charge. So I dug out those. What year was that? Oh, the, my work, their work was <clears throat> in the late 50s. And of course, my work was in just about 1960 when I actually got my experiments set up and run and getting my data on, on the uh, mm -hmm. efficiency increase. So that was my main thing and got me into the electrostatics. And I should point out that was before the Whitby particle analyzer had started that had any effect on Whitby's idea for measuring particle submicron particle size by measuring the particle mobility. But uh, he started that right after I left. Were you Whitby's first graduate student? Yeah, I was Whitby's first graduate student. He was a research professor until the summer when I started. Then he just started as a teaching professor. And I took his first course in the fall in particle technology. It wasn't the best course I ever took, but that's how I started. And we had an old textbook from Green and Lane, which had a few mistakes in it. We were able to find those when we weren't able to solve some of the equations. But it was a good start, and that's really how I got going in the field. And when I was finishing my research and writing it up and handing it in, I met Sam Jones again, and he asked me where I was going to go work. And I said, well, I have to find me a job. He says, come and work for me just down the street a couple miles. And he told me about the projects they had. And so I said, okay. He said, just come in Monday morning and tell them that we're, uh, we, we have security clearance. We do a lot of uh, high security work. So you have to come into the front desk and just tell them you want to talk to me. So on Monday I went in and told the guard I wanted to to call Sam Jones down. He came down, brought me up, and showed me to a desk in the corner. And he said, here, you can, this will be your desk, and you can start here. And I said, well, what am I going to do? He says, well, I'd like you to write a proposal. I said, what's a proposal? So that gave me a start, the real world. He said, the uh, Army Chemical Corps, the biological people, they want a sampler that can sample a large volume of air and take out all the bacteria-sized particles, the 1 to 10 micron, basically, and put them in a liquid and have a moving stream and be able to get about one minute response time for this thing and then feed that into some kind of a detector that would detect the presence of undesirable or high levels of bacteria or chemical particles. So I gave me a start on my Lund Lundgren aerosol sampler, I think we called it. That was before the Lundgren impact. Mm -hmm. And that really gave me the start and got oh. me involved. What was the principle of that? Well, it was uh, had a nozzle and <clears throat> brought it in and then into a charging zone. And then had a moving, rotating plate underneath its charging zone, and it's sort of used both inertial and electrical effects to deposit the airborne particles onto a moving liquid film over this spinning disc, big spinning disc, about I don't know, 18 inch diameter. 
and then off the edge, the liquid flowed, now containing the collected, deposited particles, and was picked up at the edge, and then that was pumped out into a little moving liquid stream. So it sampled about 10,000 liters of air, 300 CFM, and deposited those particles into 10 milliliters of liquid. I don't know what that would be, about a million to one concentration ratio. And then that would be detected. So that got me in favor with the uh, Army biological people and gave me funding for years on other projects there at the, at the department. It was the uh, General, General Mills, Mills got into this activity during World War II. They formed a mechanical division to build bomb sites and other things for the military. And after the end of the war, they no longer needed the bomb sites, so they got into mechanical things. They actually got money to do early development work on, on the computer. And they also got into work developing thin film balloon technology. And they built these big balloons, which we flew up north of Minneapolis. And they also flew them out of uh, India. They used to fly them over Russia with cameras. These are big balloons, million cubic foot balloons that would float at somewhere between 100,000 and 120,000 feet. And take pictures and they'd float over Russia and then they'd catch these things up over Alaska somehow or other with a plane. So we got into a lot of interesting projects and we had uh, sort of some experience with airborne particle collection too with some of these samplers because they were interested in collecting debris from atomic tests and they were interested in the debris from our tests that we had made, this country had made. So we got into some interesting samplers. And I got a project. Were they, were they inertial samplers? Yeah, they were inertial samplers and filter samples. They had done some work on low pressure filtration. So the filters that weren't very efficient at atmospheric pressure were pretty good at low pressure because of diffusional effects and other things that collect small particles. And of course, there are only small particles present. You know, micron, submicron size. So we had money from AEC to do that, to collect the particles, and we built various samplers to fool around up in the upper atmosphere. And then they got interested in space um, exploration, and they were interested in measuring particle matter in the atmosphere of Mars. So we had a project with Jet Propulsion Laboratory to develop an impactor for a flyby of the planet which would impact particles out onto something like a microscope slide and then move that into a microscope and focus and take pictures of it and send it back to Earth. I don't know that this thing actually ever was used, but we had a project to design it. And then from that, I got a project to design for a lander in Mars, a dust collector. So it was a, a Lundgren vacuum cleaner. It had a tube that reached out and sort of vacuumed up the surface and sucked particles in, smaller particles into the, the proposed landing device and then collected that dust out for analysis. So then we had a question of the spacecraft being contaminated through the upper atmosphere. So we designed and built a filter arrangement device, which we flew on this big balloon up to started at 100,000 plus feet, and then blew a hole in the side, a controlled orifice, and it sunk at a known rate. And we made isokinetic inlet and had filter samplers, four of them, mounted on this device. And as it settled through the atmosphere, it collected out particles. And we sampled like from 100,000 feet down to 
50,000 feet one sample and another one from 50 to 30 and 30 to 20 kind of thing. And then this thing floated from north of Minneapolis over towards the uh, Lake Michigan. And we'd follow that with a light plane and had another truck on the ground and it would land in some farmer's field about 10 hours later and we'd recover it and bring it back to the lab to wash these filters out and plate out for biological particles. All kinds of exciting projects. Yes, sir. But unfortunately, <coughs> after a couple of years, General Mills got a new president who said no reason for General Mills to be into anything but food. So they put us up for sale and Lytton Industries bought us. Well, Lytton Industries was interested in making money, not doing any interest in science. So I become disillusioned and one day the phone rang and it was Seymour Calvert from Penn State University calling. He had been hired by Penn State to start the Center for Air Environment Studies, which at the time was about the biggest center at a university for just air pollution kind of studies and work of all kinds. And he wanted someone to come and work with him and set up the laboratories for that center. Well, working at a university sounded like just the greatest thing in the world. So I flew out there and in the fall when everything was, the trees were in color like they are now. And it was so beautiful. I just walked in and said, I love it here. I'll take the job. He said, well, you got to be interviewed first. I said, oh, okay, let's do that. And I ended up taking the job and going out there at Penn State. Well, after I'd left Minnesota, <clears throat> Carl Peterson started right after I left, and he started working with Whitby on Whitby's ideas for his uh, was the Whitby analyzer, the original name of his electrostatic measurement device. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and then Bill Clark and a few others, Earl Knutson maybe worked with it over the years. Well, Whitby sold the first one to the predecessor of EPA, which was in Cincinnati, uh, funded by the Public Health Service. I forgot what it was called. Jack Wagman, John Nader worked there. They were good aerosol people. They bought one of these devices from Whitby. Well, this, this old device, nothing like the new devices that TSI makes, sample of air at about 3 CFM, <clears throat> and it took about 90% of that and cleaned it up for sheath air, and about 10% of it was particle laden, and that was what was measured. They wanted an impactor to fit at the end. Well, that's how the Lundgren impactor came to be. They gave me a $1,000 contract and said, can you design up an impactor? And I said, certainly, do that this weekend. So I was busy that weekend. Is that the one with the rotating drums? That's the one with the rotating drums. They have an example of it downstairs. And I thought about it, and Whitby's going to collect everything below three tight tenths of a micron. I figured, well, the lowest cut point I needed was 0.3 microns, and then maybe factors of three. So I made a cut point of 0.3, 1, 3, and 10 microns in this four-stage Lundgren. I knew about particle bounce. I knew about buildup and reentrainment, so I wanted a lot of collection area. So I made rotating drums, and because of the ease of design, uh -huh. I used rectangular jets. I could adjust them if they weren't quite right. They're easy to move, whereas holes, you'd have to drill a new hole. A rectangular right. jet, you just move the jet a little bit. So I built, designed up the impactor. They <laughs> liked it. So the next week I built them up. I built a couple of them. One I kept to calibrate to see if it worked like it was supposed to. And then I did some other studies with it. And I had a lot of plans for it. Well, I'd now worked on various projects. I'd been at Penn State for a couple of years or so. And uh, Helen and I and the family decided, yeah, we'd like to stay there. That was a good place. So we found a nice house to buy. And on Friday afternoon, I went in and talked to Seymour and told him that 
we found a house. We're going to buy it. We're going to close on it tomorrow. And his response was, oh, shit. I said, what's the matter? He said, can you put the closing off for a week? I said, well, I guess I could. He said, I'll talk to you Monday morning. So Monday morning, I went in and talked to him. He says, I'm leaving. I'm leaving Penn State. I'm going to California. I said, what for? Well, I think it was Brown that was governor then. And they had approved a new college of engineering that was environmentally oriented for the University of California Riverside campus. And he was hired to be the dean. And he also went out there for an interview for the statewide Air Pollution Research Center, which had been around for a long time and was headquartered at the University of California, Riverside. So they also offered him that job. And Calvert, being the kind of person that he was, he took both jobs. He said, yeah, I can do both of them. The college won't be starting that much, so I'll do both. And he said, I wanted an assistant, so I had to get permission to hire you as my assistant. So I said, oh, OK. So that ended my career at Penn State and brought me to California. And I brought the Lundgren Impactor with me. And we started doing work out there and collecting particles. And they didn't have an aerosol lab. They were doing the statewide air pollution research, but they weren't doing particles. Of course, you got to do particles. So I did a lot of work with the chemistry of the aerosol and found that the particles, the small particles, were mainly ammonium nitrate and formed in the atmosphere and all that kind of stuff. And part of a big study that we had at, uh, with Whitby and Sheldon Friedlander and others at Caltech on uh, the Pasadena aerosol experiment, I think it was called. Well, after a couple of years, they kept postponing the College of Engineering. So Seymour Calvert decided time to leave, go form my own company down in San Diego. And he told me I only had a master's degree. I taught at Penn State in California, but they wouldn't allow me to become permanent faculty because I only had a master's. He said, you should go back to school. So I decided to go back to Minnesota. Well, I wasn't able to get funding right away. And when I was at, left Lytton and went to Penn State, several other people became disillusioned with work at Lytton. So we got together and formed a company called Environmental Research Corporation in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I was still here running. So I went back and worked there for a year and got them into the air pollution control equipment field built bag houses, venturi scrubbers, packed towers, everything but electrostatic precipitators. So I did that for a year before I went back to the university. Well, I'd gotten interested in really health effects and the workplace and all, more than just straight mechanical engineering. So I went into the School of Public Health. I should have had that went in there because it was also easier. And I liked the people I had gotten to know over there. Paulus became my advisor. He was a nice guy, friend. So was Whitby, but it was just nice over there. And I got into a lot of health effects stuff, and that was fun. And I was interested in big particles. And I was interested in Whitby's idea of the bimodal distribution of the atmospherically formed submicron and the dry dispersed uh, supermicron particles. And I wanted to make a direct measurement of the mass distribution of the supermicron particles. So I designed up some big impactors, rectangular jet again. These were a sample at about 50 CFM each. And I needed a big inlet, so I built a a big piece of equipment over at the company that I was still working part-time for that sampled 1,000 CFM through a five-foot diameter inlet. And from that, I had four parallel impactors to make size classified samples from about 5 to 50 microns and measured the mass distribution of the big particles. Is that the one that later on you put in the trailer? Yeah, after I moved 
took a job at the University of Florida. I had a contract from the uh, EPA to build a mobile big particle sampler, and we put that into a, a trailer. It was actually a van, a moving head of an engine driven van that we, we used to do the analysis, and we pulled the trailer with the sampler in it. So we built that and tested it at Florida. That got me involved in some other kind well, of Well, you went work. from your PhD work to Florida. Were there some steps in there between? Yeah. No, I was uh, prematurely hired at the University of Florida. I hadn't even finished my research for my <coughs> large particle collection project at Minnesota, but I went right to Florida and then I finished that up while I was starting to teach down there. And after Florida, we had we had a training grant. That's one of the reasons I went to Florida. We were one of the, I don't know, maybe six, four, five, six universities in the United States that were funded with training grants from EPA. We got money to fund students to take graduate work in air pollution training because there weren't many students that really had good backgrounds in 1970 in air pollution. And that helped us to acquire a lot of very good students. So we had just good student population at Florida. So that made it easier and more interesting. And we were able to get some EPA funded grants and some other grants. So we had a fair amount of research and we were able to do some particle work. Matter of fact, you and I uh, worked together on calibration of those large particle impactors back in the 70s. I remember that, yes. Where we had to generate particles up to was about 100 microns. Right. No one had done that before. And they're sort of hard to handle, those 100 micron particles. They yeah. have a mind of their own. But we were able to do it. And matter of fact, we even agreed on the calibration results which was somewhat unusual. Yes, it is. Not many people agree with each other. So that was sort of got me where I am. And I've been at Florida for 45 years or something like that. I understand, you, I understand you did a lot of short courses and uh, stack sampling. Yeah, because of the grant we had <clears throat> for training, we became the Southeast Regional Training Center for EPA. And we offered short courses in air pollution and various aspects of air pollution, particle control, gas control, sampling, et cetera. So I gave short courses over about a 20, 30 year period for EPA, mounted, I guess, about 100 short courses. Really, most everything I did involved measurement. Right after I got to Florida, there was a Gordon Research contract, a Gordon Research meeting. We were attending that too, up in New Hampton, New Hampshire. And some of the aerosol people that were reporting on things didn't seem to have a total control of aerosol measurement. They worked with one method rather than another. And I sort of thought that Aerosol measurement was a primary important aspect of the aerosol field. And I thought it should be a specialty. So I talked to a couple people and decided that I should have an international aerosol measurement meeting at the University of Florida. And we set that up and had that in, I don't know, about around 1975, four. I can't remember exactly. You were down for that. Ben Liu, Ken Whitby, people from around the world that were specialists in measurement by various techniques. You, of course, covered impactors, and Whitby covered the uh, electrical aerosol analyzer, etc. Ended up with a on aerosol measurement from that conference. And it sort of got me going into the measurement area. And I think everything I've done most of my career has involved aerosol measurement. And I think that's the only area that I feel 
is really my area. Although I still consider myself a mechanical engineer, basically. A 1950s mechanical engineer. And after that, I guess a professor, and then maybe third would be a aerosol scientist. You've done a lot of things. Huh? Of all the things you've done, what do you think is the most significant? I don't think I have any one thing that was that significant. I think it's just all of the little projects involving aerosol measurement. And I, I think that aerosol measurement in general. You know, I had a lot of specialty projects that I worked on as a consultant. In measurement of sulfur dust. Florida was the big manufacturer of fertilizer. And that fertilizer involved reacting with sulfuric acid. And the sulfuric acid is made by burning sulfur. And problems with that were that was the biggest expense item in making the phosphate fertilizer was the price of the sulfur. And they wanted to bring in sulfur, dry sulfur from Canada. And the dry sulfur was dusty. So they needed some way to quantitate the dustiness of the handling of the dry solid sulfur. And they needed some way to measure the effects of, of uh, dust reduction on the dustiness. So I developed a method for doing that. And then another project I had involved asbestos fibers. Uh, the government became concerned because there was vinyl asbestos tile used in thousands of schools, and they were worried that there was causing contamination of the air from the asbestos in the vinyl asbestos tile. So we did a study and measurement, again, of the asbestos in the air and asbestos from walking on tile and handling tile and removing tile. And you and I did some work with Northern States Power on measurement and of the emissions from some of their control equipment and all. So all of these projects, I think, are really measurement. I measured the dust in some hot gas streams on uh, regeneration for a sulfur removal. And that was up to 1,000 degree temperatures. Measured the emissions from jet engine test cells for the for the Air Force and Navy. And that was sort of another fun project. I developed a diffusion classifier that would work at high temperatures. And we use that in power plants and testing jet engines and combustion aerosols that were submicron. And you really couldn't conveniently impact out. At that time, the, the Moody impactor wasn't suitable for 1,000 degree temperature sampling. So we had some stainless steel impactor. The, that actually was Mike Pilot's impactor. And then followed it with my diffusion classifier, which removed submicron. So I think just measurement in general is the only thing I'd take credit for having made, made some small contribution. Very good. Now I'm retired. I spend half of my life up in northern Minnesota because of the hot weather in Florida in the summer, and then I go back to Florida for their nice winter weather. Pretty good. Occasionally yeah. come to a meeting <clears throat> like this for one reason or another, meet old friends, talk about old times. Well, pretty good. Thank you very much for this story. You're welcome. <laughs>